It's Wednesday, and you're listening to Warlock Wednesday on anyotherpodcast.com. This is Razor, your host of the Warlock Wednesday, Warlock Hour, and welcome to another show. Going to get right to it because I've got a lot. I've actually got a huge segment coming up later on in the show. Uh, as I mentioned before, I was going to have a, a friend come on and we were going to do some sports talk. And we did it, and we just kept talking and talking. So I will let you know when that segment's coming up, because I know not a lot of you, not all of you anyways, are sports fans. But for those of you that are and want to stay tuned and listen to it, it's a great segment. We deal a lot with hockey and and baseball this week, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it when we get to it. I will let you know when it's coming up for those of you that want to skip over it or those of you who uh, are really paying attention and want to listen to it. So... Getting right into things, we're going to get to the comic book releases in just one second. Excelsior! With great power comes great responsibility. Face front, true believers. Enough said. So, it's time for your comic book releases, as was just heard by my comic book intro, which I'm still hoping to work on, but for now, that's it. Uh, so, from DC this week, we have Batman Incorporated number 9, and the following titles are all issue number 18, Flash, Superman, and Teen Titans, all issues number 18. Uh, the New 52 is really throwing off saying numbers, because it's all the same number whenever it's a new week, but... Batman Incorporated number 9, and then Flash, Superman, and Teen Titans, all issues number 18. From Marvel, uh, A- Avengers plus X-Men, or A plus X, number 6. Age of Ultron, number 3, and this is a miniseries that's going on, a 10-part miniseries, so this is book 3. Uh, Deadpool Illustrated, book 3 of 4 for the miniseries of that. Guardians of the Galaxy, number 1. Uncanny Avengers, number 5. And Young Avengers, number 3. From the Independence uh, this week, Dark Horse Comics has Angel and Faith number 20, Dynamite Entertainment has Mark Wade's The Green Hornet number 1, and Vampirilla number 27, and IDW Publishing has Doctor Who number 7, Doctor Who Prisoners of Time number 2 of 12, which is a 12 part miniseries, Judge Dredd number 5, and Star Trek number 19. So that's your comic books. As I said, I'm going to try and move through things a little quickly this week. So we're going to move right into the movie news, and of course we're always going to start the movie news with the box office reports from the past weekend. This past weekend, uh, your top tens included The Croods at number one, the animated film from DreamWorks Entertainment, starring the voice talents of Nicolas Cage, Emma Stone, and Ryan Reynolds, cracked the number one spot with $43.6 million dollars. Olympus has fallen. The uh, die-hard wannabe, as some people have called it, it's very die-hard-esque. I have not seen it myself. I do want to. It looks like a fantastic film. Uh, this movie came in at $30.3 million to grab the number two spot. Slipping from one to three, Oz the Great and Powerful, $21.5 million, bringing its three-week total up to $177 million. The Call came in at number four this week, dropping from number two to bring in another $8.9 million. Admission, the new comedy starring Paul Rudd and um, Tina Fey, came in at $6.1 million to grab the fifth spot. Uh, Spring Breakers, which increased its theater count by 1,101, uh, jumped up to uh, from 27th place last week to number six this week with $4.8 million. Uh, my local theater did not get this movie on its wide release. So I'm not expecting it anytime soon. Uh, from dropping from three to seven, the incredible Burt Wonderstone was not so incredible this week, uh, bringing in 4.3 million, and like I said, a big drop from three to seven. Jack the Giant Slayer dropping from four to eight, 2.9 million. Identity Thief dropping from five to ninth for 2.5 million. And rounding out the top ten, Snitch for down from 6th place into 10th place, $1.8 million, bringing its five-week total to $40 million. Uh, just a little tidbit about Identity Thief. It is at $127.7 million, even though it had a huge drop this week. And when you consider its budget was only $35 million, 
it's kind of huge. Uh, the other big drop this week was Jack the Giant Slayer. That one's kind of disappointing because its total for the four weeks is $59 million, yet the movie costs $195 million to make, so that kind of is falling by the wayside and not good. It's not, probably not going to make its budget, and that's always bad for a movie. So even if the movie, even if you enjoyed the movie, which uh, people did on the opening weekend, it has not had staying power and it has not lived up to expectations. So, moving on from the box office news, we're going to go into entertainment news, and there's a lot of it, so I'm going to try and plow through it as quickly as I can. Uh, first up, something that interests me very much, because I loved the movie Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, which was directed by Edgar Wright, starring, obviously, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Well, their new one, with The World's End, which is basically a film that takes place 20 years after attempting, attempting an epic pub crawl. Five childhood friends reunite when one of them becomes hellbent on trying the drinking marathon. They start at one pub, and they move all the way down the line till they get to the pub called The World's End. Hence the name of the movie. Well, this movie, which is the third of the three movies that Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg have written and want to do, and starring many British actors that I that I love, including Pegg, Nick Frost, Martin Freeman, um, Rosamund Pike. I mean, it's just looks like a fantastic movie to me. Well, this movie has had its release date pushed up. Uh, it was originally announced to be October 25th of this year. It is now coming out August 23rd, which for me is just amazing because, uh, as many of you know, my girlfriend lives in Ireland, and we will be together when this movie comes out. I'm hoping it comes to my theater as quickly as possible so that we can go see it together because we're both fans of this man's work and we want to see it. So that's an announcement of a moving update. Uh, for uh, Hercules, the new movie from Brett Ratner starring Dwayne Johnson as Hercules has cast uh, one of their... Ampharius, I think is the person's name. Anyways, it's going to be played by Ian McShane. Ian McShane is best known for playing bad guys in a lot of different movies. I uh, believe he was a bad guy in... Uh, I, I sound like Wreck-It Ralph there. You could be a bad guy, but that don't make you a bad guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Ian McShane has been all over the place playing different small roles, and he has been cast to uh, take part in Hercules, joining the cast, uh, joining uh, other, besides, oh wow, I can't talk, besides joining Dwayne Johnson, he's also got Joseph Fiennes in there, John Hurt, and Rebecca Ferguson, and uh, so this this should be great, and also, uh, in this movie, um, they've announced, or not announced, but from previous casting announcements, Rufus Sewell, who's playing Autolycus, uh, and Axel Heine, Henny, Henny, sorry, as Tedious. So that should be interesting, and I'm looking forward to this movie once it's uh, hitting theaters. And this is going to be a 2014 summer movie, so there's quite a long wait. But uh, as I said, Ian McShane had it to the cast. Speaking of Dwayne Johnson, there is a, a possibility that his character, who is, I guess I should say the name of the movie first, from the movie Fast and the Furious 6, which comes out later this year, uh, his character, Luke Hobbs, I think his name is. Uh, let me just make sure. I know it's Hobbs. I just don't know what his first name is. Anyways, Detective Hobbs, we'll call him that for now. Uh, it's possible that his character could get a solo film and it could come out even before Fast and the Furious 7 which is working. Uh, the quote uh, Johnson is says is it could arrive possibly after this one or after the next one. I'm not quite too sure. I know it's, that's the goal and we continue to build that character and have him take shape but yes I can't wait. So it looks like it's pretty set that he's going to have his own uh, solo film as Hobbs. So that's kind of interesting. I love Dwayne Johnson. I, I pretty much go see anything he's in. And I'm looking forward to Fast and the Furious 6 and his solo movie and Fast and the Furious 7. Of course, he's got Pain and Gain coming out this year and G.I. Joe, which comes out this week. And that's another thing. I almost forgot about the new releases. So let's just pause and we're going to go back. The new releases for this coming week are G.I. Joe, The Retaliation, which actually opens on Wednesday the 28th, and then on Friday we also open The Host. So those are the two movies that are coming out this week, but G.I. Joe does come out a little bit earlier, so when you're listening to this podcast, you can go to the midnight screenings on Wednesday and 
or no, it opens on Wednesday, and that's the 27th, not the 28th. That's what threw me off. You can go see this movie on Wednesday, and then the host opens on Friday. That's your two opening releases. My prediction for next week, I will be talking about J.I. Joe Retaliation being the number one movie. That's my prediction. So anyways, unpause, and back to the Dwayne Johnson news. Uh, many actors have said this, um, so Dwayne Johnson's, I guess, throwing his hat in the ring, so to speak, and not the wrestling ring this time. He wants to be in the new Star Wars movie, Episode Seven. He has talked about uh, wanting to be in this for a long time because he's a huge fan of the Star Wars franchise. Who isn't? And uh, he, what he says is Star Wars. And that's not to say that they need it. Obviously, they're doing very well with J.J. Abrams. It's just going to crush it. I'm so excited there's a guy, by the way, who's not just a brilliant director, but who honors and respects mythology. You've seen it with Star Trek, and you're going to see it with Star Wars. I'm very excited about that. And I would love to be a part of it. He wants to be in it. Almost every actor wants to be in it. I don't know if he will make it. I, I don't know what J.J. Abrams is thinking. If I did, I'd be a awesome dude but i don't so um looking forward to that and of course uh fast and the Furious 6 as i said and 7 rumored which is going to happen and of course his hobbs movie which is also going to happen now there is bad news quote unquote for uh dwayne johnson two dc comic properties that uh he was uh, formerly attached to lobo and shazam on the outs. Uh, DC slash Warner Brothers is not working on those movies anymore. He quotes, his quote is, Lobo came and went. It came, I thought it was interesting, then it kind of went away. Shazam was more interesting, and really interesting to me. I would have loved that, especially the idea of playing back at him. Again, though, studios start to look at other properties and other superhero properties, and w what makes sense and what doesn't. Then, he goes on to say, there, w there will be a superhero I do. And he grinned. And this was not referring to Hercules. Hercules isn't a superhero. But he is going to do a superhero. Let the speculation wonder. Excuse me. Did a lot of talking tonight, so not feeling 100%. However, I'm pushing on. Anton, Anton, or Antoine Fuqua, who directed Training Day with Denzel Washington is looking to direct Denzel Washington again, this time in the movie adaptation of The Equalizer. For those of you who were born after the 1980s, you probably have no idea what this is. For myself and those of us who lived through the 80s, we know that it's based on a television show that was uh, that starred Edward Woodward as Robert McCall, who was a private detective with a lot of contacts and is available to hire if you have a problem you don't know how to solve. That's kind of quoting the opening uh, little tag lines that came with the opening credits. And basically, um, not sure how I, I think about this now. Denzel did win an Oscar for Training Day. Personally, that year, I didn't think he deserved it. I thought there was better actors. It was actually one of the, that was one of the years where it kind of was the, the straw that broke the camel's back for me, where I didn't watch the Oscars for a very long time. However, Antoine Fuqua put uh, proved that he could be a good director and a good director of Denzel Washington. So could this make sense? Maybe. Uh, personally, I'm not sold on the idea. I We've seen many TV shows from the 70s and 80s recently turned into movies, and none of them have been spectacular. Some have been entertaining, but most of them have failed. So I don't know where this is going, but that's what's happening. Okay, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Got a few news from this. Um, I shouldn't even call it that. I should just call it the Ninja Turtles movie because that's what it is. It's bullshit. But I'm still reporting what I read so that you, the, the listener, can decide on your own. Uh, recently, they've booked a ski resort uh, in the uh, Tupper Ski Area in Tupper Lake, New York. Now, most of the film is going to be filmed in New York City itself. But uh, Tupper Lake is uh, a place where they're going to be filming for three days. And apparently one of the scenes is going to involve a golf course and a helicopter landing on the driving range. That's what has been said. Now, uh, further t uh, <laughs> further Ninja Turtle news. <laughs> uh, they've cast uh, Raphael. Now, before I go and say who the actor is... It doesn't matter who the actor is. You're just going to hear his voice. Because all the turtles are going to be done mocap. 
for those of you who don't know what mocap is, it means motion capture. Think Gollum from Lord of the Rings. They're, they're going to use total motion capture, or if you want to think of Caesar from uh, Planet of the Apes remake. Um, or prequel, in a sense. Remake slash prequel. But yes, it's going to be total motion capture, so it doesn't matter who who's playing in the uh, Turtles because they're not going to be dressed up in foam suits this time, as they were in the original trilogy. They are just going to do the voices. And the voice for Raphael is Alan Richson. And he, uh, he's formerly, he's, he's, he's actually in Hunger Games Catching Fire, and he's also a former Abercrombie, Abercrombie and Finch, Fitch model. And I can't even say that. I don't know how people can buy those sweaters when you can't even say the freaking word. Well, yeah, that's just me, though. Uh, anyways, he's also known for playing Arthur Curry, a.k.a. Aquaman, on the TV series um, Smallville. And in The Hunger Games, he's going to be playing a character of Gloss, who is one of the tributes in the 75th Hunger Games, uh, which comes out later this year. Uh, he doesn't have a very big role, but he is in it. Uh, he has worked with Motion Capture before. Uh, he worked with Robert Zemeckis on Beowulf, where he played Ray Winstone's body double. So he played Ray Winstone's character... Uh, in the movie, he did all the mocap for it, so he's already done this. Now, whether he knows martial arts and he's going to be doing the mocap for Raphael, I don't know, but that's what it is. Now, at that time, when I when I got that, they hadn't cast the other turtles. However, before I started recording, there was an announcement that they have cast the other turtles, and the other turtles are Jeremy Howard, who's uh, last seen in Galaxy, well, not last seen, but um, is known for Galaxy Quest. He's going to be the voice of Donatello. Pete. Plazezic, who uh, people might know from Parks and Rec, or Parks and Recreation, for those of you who want the full title. He's going to play Leonardo. And then Noel Fisher is going to be playing uh, Michelangelo, and he was in uh, a movie called Shameless. So those are your four turtles, plus you had Megan Fox's April O'Neil, and you got a shit pot of crap that's going to be the Ninja Turtles movie. Because as, as Ralph Garman would say, that is a movie that will suck. Ralph Garman, not a sponsor. Uh, Ryan Reynolds. For all you Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern haters, uh, guess what? Ryan Reynolds is not interested in returning as Green Lantern right now. He says, I, I saw how difficult it is to make that concept palatable and how confused it all can be when you don't really know exactly where you're going with it or you don't really know how to access that world properly. The world comic book fans have been accessing for decades and falling in love with so... At this point, I have very little interest joining that kind of world. He goes on to say, a great script and a good director can always turn that around. He admits, I believe that Joss Whedon is the guy that just nails it. And Christopher Nolan, obviously he nails it. So if they were going to do it like that, it would be an interesting thing to do. So basically, he's not coming back as Green Lantern in the Justice League movie. Uh, it, he would not. He would only return on the basis of the script and the director. And I think he's got a point. I don't blame Ryan Reynolds for Green Lantern. I know many people do. I think it was just a badly written movie, badly directed movie. And uh, I think Ryan Reynolds could actually play the Green Lantern very well. However, because of this movie, I don't think we'll see Ryan Reynolds as Green Lantern again. I know that will make Ralph Garman happy. And again, Ralph Garman, not a sponsor. <laughs> okay, so moving on. Um... I just want to check something out here. Yes, there we go. Okay, Captain America Winter Soldier has a casting announcement. And this blew my mind when I saw the title. UFC champion George St. Pierre joins Captain America the Winter Soldier. GSP, one of the best MMA fighters in the ring. Not the best, but one of the best in the ring. Pound, per, pound for pound fighters who recently defended his title at UFC 158 or 168. I don't know what number they're on. 100 and some odd matches. He just de recently defended his title against Nick Diaz in Montreal a couple of Saturdays ago and did a phenomenal job of, of beating Nick Diaz better than anybody ever has. Now, he didn't win outright. He, it went to decision. And a lot of people are saying because G GSP is getting so much older that you know, his time is winding down, and that's true. I mean, in, in a sport where you just definitely need to be at the peak of physical performance, he has done it for so many years, and eventually he is going to have to retire. I just hope he retires as champion, because he is such a phenomenal fighter. He is such a great ambassador for Canadian athletics, and uh, 
he is now joining Captain America the Winter Soldier. Who will he play, you ask? He will be playing French kickboxing master Georges Batrock, a.k.a. Batrock the Leaper. So he's actually going to be a kickboxing, almost mixed martial arts type of guy. And uh, he is primarily a Captain America foe, so this is really cool. I'm actually so much more excited now for Captain America than I've ever been before. And George St. Pierre is the reason why. All right, Sam Mendez. Uh, I reported earlier on a different podcast a few weeks ago that he he's been in the news for Bond for quite some time ever since he directed the biggest Bond, the biggest grossing Bond uh, with 1.1 billion dollars worldwide, Skyfall. Well, here's what uh, Kathleen Kennedy, who is running things over at MGM, or is not Kathleen? Sorry, I'm thinking. That's, that's that's somebody totally else I'm confusing things right now. Barbara Broccoli is from MGM says we will get him back. We haven't given up hope. Maybe not for the next one, but we will get him back. Uh, the other producer, Michael G. Wilson, says we are working on him. We hope that maybe he will have gotten inspired to come back. And Sam himself says Bond movies. They need someone working on it now. I'm doing my theater projects and then I'll work out. I've definitely left the door open though. I've never really repeated myself, done the same type of movie one after the other. So just give me a chance to think about what I actually want to say. What this tells me is that he is probably going to end up being a producer in this next James Bond film. And then he will direct the final, or at least the final one that Daniel Craig is signed for, James Bond film. This is what I think. I think there is a story there that they want to tell, and Sam Mendes just has to get his act together and uh, work on this. And I believe Sam Mendes will be directing Daniel Craig as James Bond in possibly Daniel Craig's final James Bond film. That's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. Moving on to uh, other news. Many fans are not happy with the fact that um, the, I don't know, sci-fi, I guess? the One of the best movie badasses, Snake Plissken, and the Escape From series, Escape From New York specifically, is going to be rebooted. However, I'm kind of excited because rumor has come down the pipeline that Tom Hardy and Jason Statham are up for the role of Snake Plissken. Personally, if I had to choose between two, I would choose Jason. However, either guy can pull this off. I think that while there's going to be a huge outcry of people not happy that, that Escape from New York will be rebooted, in my opinion, neither of these guys is a bad choice to play Snake Plissken, and I would definitely go see it if either of these guys are cast. So that's that, and I'm moving on. Some little bit of funny news. In Scotland, there is a bill that covers both same-sex marriage and the detail of important protections in relation to religious bodies and celebrants, freedom of speech, and education. Basically, they have passed a bill that... uh, any, it doesn't really matter what religion. It it doesn't have to be a religious person to basically officiate the wedding. So uh, the quote from uh, the BBC uh, says, The third category is quite astonishing because it is a so-called belief category without really defining what belief means. There are loads of people in a diverse society like this for whom belief can mean virtually anything. You have the Flat Earth Society and the Jedi Knight Society. Who knows? I'm not saying that we don't give the, give place to that kind of personal belief, but when you start making allowances for marriages to be performed within those categories, then you are all over the place. Here's what it's saying. Basically, a Jedi Knight, which is an official religion in the UK and in Ireland, can perform a, seri- a, a, a ceremony to marry you. And 
Uh, the, the gentleman writing the article says, After thinking all of my life that I would have a Catholic church wedding, I got married in Vegas, and while I had the chance for Elvis or a mobster to officiate, my wife and I chose the non-sequent civil servant to perform the duty. I didn't think to ask what she believed in, because it didn't reflect on the legality of my courtship. So what's the problem? After all, wouldn't it be amazing to see someone use only the force to play Here Comes the Bride on the organ? So... Uh, just a little bit of funniness in this world of sci-fi where it's possible for a Jedi Knight could, for all intents and purposes, marry you. And they had a little picture here with Obi-Wan Kenobi, and I'm talking the real Obi-Wan, Alec Guinness, and it says, this isn't the spouse you're looking for. Oh, some playing Jedi mind tricks. Moving on to television news quickly. Uh... There's been rumors, and they've been running rampant recently, that Matt Smith will be leaving Doctor Who after the 2013 Christmas special. Nothing's really been confirmed or denied. Stephen Moffat has said forever, for the rest of time, when in, in relation to Matt Smith and how long he would play the role. Uh, BBC has said, sorry folks, but we don't. We even we don't know what's going to happen at Christmas. It's not being written yet, but Matt loves the show and it's and his start to filming the unmissable 50th anniversary and the new series starting on Easter Sunday. And the, what they're saying the new series is the continuation of series seven. Uh, it's not exactly a denial, and neither is Smith's answer, which he says, "I'm very happy doing it. I do the anniversary special, then the Christmas special. At the moment, it's 2013, and we will see what 2014 holds." This is not good to a fan of Doctor Who. Um, Matt, as as we all know, as, as is the norm with Doctor Who, uh, the Doctor changes all the time. We've seen ten of them. This is our 11th Doctor. We've seen ten changes to get to our 11th Doctor. And it's quite possible at the end of Christmas special, we might see our, 12th, our 11th change to get us to our 12th Doctor. And... I, for one, am not sure how I feel, although fans have definitely voiced their concern. There's obviously some who don't want him to leave. You always have fans of the current Doctor. Uh, personally, my favorite Doctor will always be David Tennant, no matter what comes along now. Uh, David Tennant was just too phenomenal, in my opinion. My previous favorite Doctor was Tom Baker, and now it is David Tennant. Uh, so, um, with that being said... Fans want David Tennant to come back as the twelfth. I don't know if the how, if or how or even what they would say to explain that, but you know they could just use timey wimey all kinds of jargon that they throw in at us at a Doctor Who episode. Speaking of Doctor Who episodes, you know who would like to direct one? Peter Jackson. Yes, that Peter Jackson, the one who's directed three Hobbit movies and three Lord of the Rings movies. And while we've only seen one Hobbit movie, he's still directed all three, because he films them all at once and then releases them a year at a time. Well, he says that he would be interested in doing a, a uh, episode. Um, Stephen Moffat, has, he's talked to Stephen Moffat over the holidays and said, you know, expressed interest. Um... The article writer says presumably it would be a solitary episode and not three episodes filmed at the same time and released once every few months in basically jest of how he does his movies. Jackson says they don't even have to pay me. He says it with a grin and then he says, but I have got my eye on one of those nice new gold colored Daleks. They must have a spare one. Hint, hint. So basically he'd direct an episode and he'd do it just for a prop. He would do it just to get a Dalek. So. You never know what could happen. Where uh, you never get any information out of Moffat, as he says. Uh, he he also goes on to say we're theoretically on board for anything, provided we've got a great story. So who knows? Maybe in the next season, maybe in, in season series eight, we will get to see a Peter Jackson directed episode of Doctor Who. All right, folks. I have uh, to take a little break here. You're just going to hear a little bit of a kind of self-promotion from one of our friends here at AnotherPodcast.com. Hi, I'm Rob Cicchetto, and you're listening to AnotherPodcast.com. All right. So moving on to some gaming news. Um, I don't have too much for you this week. I was really busy with a lot of other things, so I didn't have a time to pull stuff together and uh, – 
actually, before I do move on to gaming news, I want to tell you that there's going to be a, a little thing in the description kind of relating to the uh, Doctor Who stuff that I was just talking about. Unfortunately for you John Barrowman, Captain Jack Harkness fans, it has been confirmed by John Barrowman himself. He will not be a part of the 50th anniversary, and I have proof, as I will put it in the description below from his tweet earlier today, March 20, or early, or late Sunday, I guess it was, March 24th. And, um, yeah, unfortunately, he's not going to be part of it, and that's just sad. So, as I said before, moving on to gaming news, uh, Blizzard Entertainment has announced a new game called Hearthstone Heroes of Warcraft. And what this is, is a new free-to-play strategy card game for PC and iPad, and lets you hang up your sword and throw down your gauntlet. That's their exact quote. Um, for those people who are at PAX East, I hate you. No, I'm just kidding. Um... Demos are starting up. There was, a, uh, sorry, betas are going to be starting up soon. So if you're a Blizzard fan and you have a Blizzard account, you can go sign up and get part of the uh, the beta and or apply to be part of the beta. Um, it's going to be a cross-platform free-to-play game for Windows, Macintosh, and iPad. Uh, basically, it's going to be like Magic: The Gathering mixed with a little bit of World of Warcraft and give, excuse me, give you that Warcraft feel. So. In needless to say, I'm very interested, and uh, there's a big press release about it on Blizzard.com, or sorry, Blizzard.net. I keep forgetting it's Blizzard.net. Um, you can also go to Blizzard.com. I think there's a redirect, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and by the way, not a sponsor. Uh, here's what the here's the little write-up from Mike Morheim, who is the CEO and co-founder of Blizzard. Uh, We've always loved collectible card games at Blizzard, so it's been exciting to bring everything we love about the genre to life in Hearthstone. We're putting a lot of focus into creating a fun new game that's easy to pick up and play, but also has a lot of depth. Depth. We can't wait to share it with everyone. So there's going to be packs for sale. They haven't set uh, a set um, uh, price on the packs, but every every indication is it's going to be like a dollar ninety nine cents or something like that. And you can tune your decks, and the more you win, you can earn some cards. They also have like legendary and epic and elite and all kinds of different cards you can have um different battles with other players different ways depending on how you make your deck have different outcomes obviously you you want to try and win the more you win the better cards you can get um the thing is i'm not very good with these card games i'm i'm actually pretty bad i'm still looking forward to it but i'm pretty bad so what i'm going to do is in the description below, I am going to link a video. And in this video, one of my favorite World of Warcraft uh, players slash YouTubers will explain, because uh, she was there live listening, or she, she was, sorry, she was streaming live the, the actual press conference when this happened. I was at work, so I couldn't do it. Uh, so she has more information, and she will tell you, and her name is uh, Trey Chat. At least that's her YouTube name. She's also known as Danielle, for those of you who watched King of the Nerds, like myself, who is a nerd. And she will explain a little bit more and give you an indication, if you watch the video, of what some of it looks like. Because she was able to screen cap some of the videos, as she has permission, because she actually works for um, different... Uh, I believe it's... She doesn't work for World of Warcraft. She works for a magazine that puts out World of Warcraft information, so she does have permission, and definitely listen to her stuff, and hey, like and subscribe. She might like that. I would definitely help bring uh, viewers to her channel, and if that brings you to her channel, great. But basically what I'm saying is she's going to have a better description of this game than I did, so I'm going to put that in the description below. So there you go. All right, so moving on, we're not going to do... Oh, no, I have one more bit of gaming news. Uh, many of you listening to this on Wednesday will have known that yesterday, Bioshock Infinite came out. And that, my friends, is supposed to be a fantastic game. It doesn't interest me because I'm not a first-person or even a third-person shooter type of fan. However, this game looks really fantastic. And if uh, I had the money... I would probably be picking it up tomorrow or yesterday, depending on what. Like I'm, li I'm recording this on Monday, so I'd pick it up tomorrow. But you're listening to it on Wednesday, so yesterday I would have picked it up. But I don't have the money either way, so it doesn't matter. I'm not picking it up. However, it does look fantastic, and those of you who are interested in that type of game, if you didn't pick it up yesterday, 
go out and buy it today because it is now on shelves. All right, folks, we've come to that time where, for those of you who don't want to listen to sports, there's going to be a long segment coming up. And uh, if you don't want to listen, I, I understand. I hope you will. I really want you to give it a listen. I really want you to hear what Zach has to say because it is nice. And it was so different because I do all these podcasts and I've done them all solo so far. So it's just me talking and basically you listening. Uh, there was no, there's no back and forth. No back and forth doesn't make interesting conversation all the time because it's not really a conversation. It's just me giving you information and hopefully you listening to it. This is a f- good back and forth uh, conversation between me and a friend from work uh, who both enjoy sports and I hope you listen. Before we get to it, I do have another little promo to put in here uh, and I hope you'll listen to that too. Hi, I'm Rob Cicchetto, creator of Zombie Portraits. You can check out Zombie Portraits at zombieportraits.com. So there you go. And now, as I promised, here's the sports. All right, folks, welcome to the sports segment of the podcast. And I have a guest with me right now, and uh, his name is Zach. So, Zach, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, folks, uh, Zach here. Just uh, just came on. I was interested in... Uh, joining his podcast because we like to argue a lot about sports at work, uh, both like some of the same teams and uh, looking forward to sharing some knowledge on here. I'm good to go whenever. All right. So let's uh, get with the first thing. We're going to do the NHL standings. So just looking at the Eastern Conference first, uh, not much movement from last week. We have Pittsburgh still in first place uh, with 50 points. Montreal holding down the second spot with 45, Winnipeg with 36, Boston with 43, Ottawa with 40, Toronto sitting in 6th with 37, New Jersey 7th with 36 points, and the Rangers rounding out the top 8 with 33 points. Uh, Three teams kind of battling it out for the last playoff spot there. Actually, four with with the Carolina Hurricanes also battling it out with Winnipeg for the division lead. Uh, Carolina, Washington, and New York Islanders, 31 points, 32 for Carolina, 31 for both Washington and the Islanders. So with that, uh, any of those teams you think can bump it up? Like Washington's been pouring it on of late. Uh, do you think they can bump it up into the playoffs, or do you think it's too little too late? Well, um, the way Ovi's been playing, he's he's looking like the Ovi of old, so um, that's a good sign for them. I don't know if it's too little too late for them, but uh, with the surge they put on, they're looking like the hot team they used to be. So Yeah, like, they've got about, what, so they've played 32 games, so they've got 16 games left. Uh, the Rangers actually have been slipping a little bit. Uh, they're holding the eighth spot right now, but with 33 points and three teams right behind them. And even Buffalo, although I think they're pretty much out of it, they're three points back, but... Um, they haven't been playing very well. The scoring is down. Uh, Miller's not been playing very well. I think they've had better goaltending from some of their backup goalies that have played this year than, than Miller. I think, uh, I think Buffalo will, uh, I don't think they'll make the playoffs, but I think they'll creep up. They'll, I think they'll pass the Islanders at least. Yeah. But, uh, uh I don't Islanders see them have goaltending issues as well. I mean, uh, goaltending is always a problem in, with a lot of teams that that don't make the playoffs. So uh, that's tough too. As far as the tops of the divisions, uh, again, I've said this on previous podcasts. Winnipeg is the division leader, so they get the third spot. Yet, if we were to rank them by points, they'd actually be behind Toronto, and Toronto would be in fifth place. And Winnipeg would be in sixth, then it'd be New Jersey, and then the Rangers. Uh, so I, I don't know. Uh, have you seen what the new divisions are going to look like for uh, the next season? I have. Um, do you think that's going to be? It's a little confusing to me, but yeah, let's see how it works. Do you think it's going to be better though? I mean, the Division C to me looked like so such a big, tough division. Um, I don't know what they're going to call it, but right now it's Division C. Uh, it's got like. Montreal, Toronto, Detroit, Boston, Ottawa, um, Buffalo, I think, is in that one as well, uh, and two other teams. I uh, can't remember off the top of my head, but it, it seems like it's the much tougher 
division, and, and it's quite conceivable that five teams out of the eight that make it in the Eastern Conference could come from that division. It's uh, There's going to be a lot of good rivalries in there, too. Um, most well, of the original six teams are in yeah, there. So. You bring back the Toronto-Detroit rivalry, which hasn't happened exactly. since 93 when Toronto was still in the Western Conference. Back when I was a little baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so that's the Eastern Conference. Let's move over to the West, where the top team in the league, although not by much anymore, they they were running away with it for quite some time. The Chicago Blackhawks, 51 points, still leading the league in points, but now they're only one up on Pittsburgh, who's Pittsburgh's been on such a tear recently, and we'll get into more of that when we get into the trades later. But uh, Chicago's number one with 51. Then you got Anaheim, number two with 48. Vancouver, number three with 40. Minnesota, 38. Detroit, 37. Los Angeles, 36. St. Louis, 36. Dallas, 33. And here's where the Western Conference differs from the East. Almost everybody's still in it, with the exception of the bottom two or three teams. But San Jose, San Jose, Nashville, Columbus, 32 points each. Phoenix with 30. Um, yeah, I know you don't want to talk about the bottom because Colorado's sitting right there with 26. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but, you know, Florida's got 24, so they're not the worst in the league. So <laughs> at least well, Colorado they're... did get the streak ended for Chicago, so exactly. they have one thing. As, as I was mentioning, I believe, uh, last week or the week before, Colorado ended Chicago's streak, and Chicago's lost two times since that streak ended in regulation. So they're 24-3-3 and Chicago now, so... I mean, maybe Colorado has bumped them down a little few notches there. <laughs> but the Western Conference has always been a tight conference. Like the bottom, when you look at the top three teams, they usually have a, a, a runaway lead. But the bottom five, six teams that are trying to get in, it's so tight all the time. Like every year, and it's always different teams too. Like you you have your Detroit, so uh, who is always – almost a perennial team that's always making the playoffs. But then you have like other teams like Columbus will jump in one year and then, you know, Nashville will jump in another year and then Phoenix jumps in like last year, Phoenix rolled into the playoffs on a, on a high. I think what did they go to the semifinals or the, no, they went to the uh, th- second round, right? I think it was the second. Round. Yeah. So, and they rode their goaltending all the way and that's where, goaltending can help is definitely when you're making a playoff run. Well, um, the thing about the West was it was always such a competitive conference. Uh, usually, if you looked at the standings at the end of the year, the up to the 11th, 12th spot in the West could have made a playoff spot in the East. But um, I don't think that's the case anymore. The East is just as competitive now, so... Uh, I, yeah, it is. Uh, I agree. I think the East has uh, improved their competitiveness, although I think part of the reason this year we're seeing a lot more parity is the East is not playing the West. It's only playing the East, East, yeah. So, I mean, uh, when you have that crossover, like next year when we get a full schedule and you have those teams crossing over, the West teams, although Detroit will no longer be in the West, so maybe that dominance, because Detroit dominated Eastern teams a lot, maybe that dominance will kind of pair out and, and there will be some balance because uh, also Columbus is moving to the East. Not that they're a powerhouse, but uh, they are pouring it on right now. Like Sergei Bobrovsky has been huge for them in the past two weeks, uh, posting goals against average last week of .62. Even though he lost two games in a shootout, he only gave up two goals in three games. Were, were you surprised with the San Jose slide? Uh, yeah, I was because they started so hot, but I mean, uh, their goaltending again, it, it, it boils down to goaltending. I think a lot of times, especially in a shortened season, which is why I think Toronto even dropped off. Like they started pretty hot too, but the goaltending in San Jose has been, I mean, you have a good goalie. They have like a top number one goalie, but the problem is you can't ride him through the whole season. And that's what they were trying to do. Also, when your scoring lets up, I mean, they haven't been scoring as much as they were. Who do you um, who do you think, if any of the two get traded for goalies, Ryan Miller or Luongo? 
I think Luongo is going to be an off-season acquisition for any team. I don't think he gets traded this year. If you look at the way Vancouver's played, like, I mean, neither goalie has really stepped up to be the number one. They'll have, like, like Luongo will have a great game, and then he'll, like, get the start the next game, and he bombs. Schneider will have a great game, and then he'll get the start the next game, and he'll bomb. They're trying to go with the hot goalie, but it's hard because they have a good game, and then they have a bad game, and that's how it's been going. Now, they've won some of those bad games, like, they're, because their scoring was there, they, they had, like, they would win games like 5-4, 6-5, and, and stuff like that. Like, does that mean your goaltending's been good? Not really. I mean, you're getting the win. You're putting the win in the win column, but you're not necessarily proving that your goaltending is strong. So I don't think they trade either of them. I, I mean, we all know Luongo chokes in the playoffs. So, I mean, in, in, when it comes to playoffs, I'd start Schneider, but... <laughs> they, they wrote him a lot more this year than they said they were going to, though, until oh, yeah. uh, they could find a good uh, trade. Absolutely, I, I agree. I think Luongo's played a lot more than anybody expected him to, and I think that goes down to the fact that he's trying to play his way back onto the team. But, I mean, or play for, like, to show showcase to other teams that, hey, I still got it. So... Um, I, but again, with that one, I think that trade happens in the off season. As far as Miller's concerned, with um, many teams needing a veteran goalie, even my team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, I don't think Toronto makes that trade. It all depends on the price, and I think me and you have discussed this before. The price for goalies, the pr- the asking price from the other GMs, is so high that teams just don't want to make that trade. It's hard to think you would trade a guy like Miller, but. Out of the playoff spots, um, the new coaching change was a surprise too. To me, yeah, at least. Uh, so. Speaking of coaches, what about Tampa Bay firing theirs? Yeah, I think it needed to be done. Agreed. I, I think Tampa Bay, like, I mean, I like Tampa Bay as a, as far as a, a team goes because they they've always been a classy team as, ever since they entered the league. But I mean, they've got to me one of the best players in the entire NHL and. Crosby be damned, Stamkos to me is a much better hockey player and a much more exciting player to watch. And so, I mean, and that brings up another question. Do they trade St. Louis because they're trying to build the team to maybe get a goalie? Uh, like, goaltending for Tampa Bay has been all right this year. I wouldn't say it's been great. It's it's uh, Getting goaltending should be a big priority. I mean, if you look at it, they're second in the East in goals for, and they sit 14th in the conference. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. Like, I mean, uh, what did they got? They have a hundred. They're second in the whole league, actually, in goals for. Uh, so. Yeah, they are. 103 goals. So, I mean, they're on the plus side of the differential by a hair. I mean, Five, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know. So, definitely goaltending is an issue in Tampa Bay. And I think it's been an issue since um, Rolison left. And Rolison even wasn't great, he was average at best. Because, I mean, he was at the twilight of his career. He was like 39 years old and 40 years old when he gave them their last run. But, I mean, he's he was probably the last goaltender they had that could be a bona fide number one. Lindback's trying, but I don't think he's a number one goalie. I think he's an excellent backup goalie, but I don't think he's a number one goalie. It's kind of the same situation as Toronto. They have two great backup goalies, but they don't have a bona fide number one goalie. Well, we'll see how that plays out over the uh, deadline. Yep. It's something you should for sure look for is to see if they'll go out and get a goalie. Uh, I think so. I, I, um, again, if they don't go out and get a goalie in, in the, at the deadline, which is like just over a week away, I believe that the off season you're going to see some moves. Work. Well, I don't see them making the playoffs anyways this year, oh. so it might, it, they might not be rushing to find that. They, exactly. They'll look for the right choice. Exactly. So. Why, why rush to get a goalie when you know you're not going to make the playoffs? It's just so, tough to come back like I mean like there's we've got just under a month I think left of the season as I said earlier most teams have about 16 to 18 games left so it, it's hard to make a run when you're already five points out of a playoff spot and, and it doesn't seem like a lot but in a shortened season that's huge because every game is is a is a backbreaker when you lose because you're losing probably to somebody ahead of you unless you're playing Florida <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, I just saw this on TSN.ca. I don't know if you got to see okay. it, but, um, Semin just inked a five year contract with the Hurricanes. All right. So Semin's, uh, staying with the Hurricanes. That's not, uh, not a bad pickup. He's, he's shown improvement defensively this year, too. So, 
Yeah, uh, they've looked decent at times. They they haven't looked fantastic. I honestly thought Carolina was a better team than Winnipeg, but Winnipeg's gotten the the goal scoring at much needed times. However, when you look at like when when we look at their numbers, I mean, Carolina scored eighty five goals, given up eighty six. Winnipeg scored eighty four goals, given up ninety eight. So I mean, they're both in the negatives, but. As far as Carolina is concerned, they're a better goaltending team, and I think that comes down to Cam Ward. But he's been injured this year, and I think that's hurt them. What I was surprised with was um, how much Washington dropped off without Senan. Yeah, it's just like um, like you look at well, you look at Tampa Bay for example, and you look at how much uh, St. Louis does as far as getting assists. When when Lecavier was scoring all those goals, it was because of St. Louis. Stamkos is like uh, the league leader in goals right now, and it's because of St. Louis. If Tampa Bay trades St. Louis at the deadline, which they could very well do because they are going to be a selling team, I think it's going to be bad for like Stamkos in a way because he doesn't have a setup man. Personally, I think Steve Eiserman is smarter than that. I don't think he trades St. Louis. I think he can build his team very well. He has the Detroit... Uh, mentality, having played there for so many years and seeing how they've done it. I mean, you look at Detroit, they've never had a top 10 pick in probably decades, yet they build their teams up so well and players will sign lower contracts just to stay with that team because of how well they build their team. And Steve Iserman brings that mentality to Tampa Bay. So I don't think St. Louis should be traded because he helps Stamkos. That being said, he's definitely a player that every team wants. Well, no one, no one can draft. No one drafts as well as Detroit. Everyone knows that. So. So. Their scouts are just amazing. It's, it's insane the way they can draft. Yeah. But, they, uh, late first round pick and half the time I've seen them trade it just to get into the later rounds, an extra pick in like the second round or something like that. And they make those picks pay off so well. Anyways, back to the stamp coach though. I think that, um, Regardless, just the talent that he has, he'll do he'll do fine no matter who he's with. He's but, so yeah, talented. St. Louis does help him out. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, so speaking of points, I'm going to get into the statistics now. Unfortunately, our points leader is still Mr. Sidney Crybaby Crosby. He has 53. <laughs> Love that, eh? <laughs> yeah, uh, he has 53 points, 39 assists, both leading the league in that. As I said earlier, Stamkos is leading in goals with 22, with uh, Chris Kunitz and Tavares. Uh, right behind him at 19. Uh, Kunitz is also your plus-minus leader at 24. And st- still injured, but still leading the league in goals against average and save percentage is Craig Anderson of the Ottawa Senators. Uh, I don't know if he's still eligible to win those kind of titles now that he's been injured so long because he hasn't played so much. But with a shortened season, I don't know how many games they actually have to play to be considered for the Vesna. Because, I mean, with, with, with those numbers, that's Vesna-like quality right there. But... I don't know with the shortened season how many games you have to play. I know with a regular 82 game season, I think you have to play 75 percent, or si- no, 65 percent. I think it is of the games to be qualified for the award. So I'm not sure if Anderson qualifies under this shortened season. If he doesn't, uh, Corey Crawford of Chicago has a 1.86 goals against average. He's second on that one, and the save percentage is uh, Tuka Rask at 9.28. Uh, wins goes to Mark Andre Fleury. He has 17, and shutouts is still Pekka Rene of the Nashville Predators with five. I, uh, he um, leads the league in shutouts, and like, Nashville's like not that great of a team right now. I mean, they're, oh, they were surprised too. I, I thought they were going to do a lot better, but oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they, I think in the beginning, which is when they started uh, not so well, like they, they've kind of. Even their team out, I think they're actually a 500 team. If I look at their thing quickly, yeah, 13 and 13 and six, so they're a 500 team. But the the most of those losses come in the beginning of the season. I think it's just a whole uh, like Weber and Sutter not being together. And I think the same thing happened with Minnesota. Like they've come on stronger of late too because Weber and Sutter were so good together that splitting them apart hurt both players. As I think. Um... Weber helped Sutter a lot. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he was worth his contract. But, oh, uh, uh, yeah, we, we've seen some contracts signed recently. I, I think Weber gave, made him that contract, but 
yeah, I agree. Uh, Minnesota, like they they went out and they spent. They they really did. I mean, they got Zach Parise uh, and uh, Suter. So, I mean, you spend that kind of money, you you got to succeed. Otherwise, it's a total bust. Back to the uh, Anderson thing. I'm gonna assume that uh, with his like, I, I would assume that if um, he didn't qualify then his numbers wouldn't be up there on the stats so yeah that's that's exactly what i'm thinking like he's on the stats page i'm gonna assume that he's uh i think um, he is due back within the next week or so so if if he comes back and plays out most of the games that are left in the season and keeps the numbers where they were um when he comes back which is always hard to do when you come back from an injury especially when you've been out for over a month now uh it whether he can maintain those numbers will remain to be seen, but if he can, I mean, look out for the Ottawa Senators in the final weeks of the season. Yeah, for sure. How about uh, how about Ovi back on top for uh, power play goals? Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty amazing that uh, he's moved up so well. Like like we were saying earlier, Washington's really poured it on. And speaking of Ovechkin, he's the first star this week. He had five goals and three assists in the four games he played. And most of those goals were on the power play, which is why he's moved up in the power play uh, rankings as far as power play goals. So, yeah, Alex Ovechkin gets the first star this week on a team that looked like they probably weren't going to make the playoffs for the longest time. They go out and they have a huge week, and they've just jumped back up right into They're, they're looking good. Yeah, I mean, 31 points. That's two points behind the Rangers. Uh, with They have 16 games left. The Rangers have 17. But still, like it's. I think if any team gets in it that's out of it right now would be Washington. Washington, yeah, they're just pouring it on. Like, and and if they keep up the run, yeah, definitely, absolutely. Carolina has a good shot too, but I I would take Washington. I would take Washington too, simply on the uh, like like you said earlier, Ovechkin's returning to form. I think that's amazing. Uh, so great for hockey. So. Yeah, absolutely. So with the three stars, as as I said, Alex Ovechkin was number one. The second star was Nicholas Backstrom of the Minnesota Wild, the the goaltender, uh, not the player, <laughs> because I know there's a player named Nicholas Backstrom. Um, he was 3-0 this week with a 1.0 goals against average and a 972 save percentage, helping Minnesota uh, increase their playoff uh, chances as they've moved into fourth place in the West. And the third star this week from my own Toronto Maple Leafs, Nazem Kadri, who had seven points in three games. Uh, he had three goals and four assists, and that I mean, he has really come on this season. Um, he, I think he was held back under the old system, under um, uh, who was coach there? I can't even remember, and I'm a Leafs fan. Uh, Ron Wilson. Yeah, Ron Wilson. I think he was held back. I, th- I mean, yeah, probably playing in the Marlies helped him develop his game, which is always what you want to do. But I don't think Ron Wilson would have him up this year if Ron Wilson was still the coach. I think Randy Carlisle has a different system, and you can even see it with Kessel. Kessel actually comes back and back checks now, and I think that that system is what made the has made the Leafs a playoff contender this year. Well, all I can say is that Kadri's making me shit right now. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on him ever since he got drafted, but he's what ninth in the league in points right now. Yeah, I mean. Uh... He's been and he's been hot of late. Like uh, he's been really pouring it on. Kadri's uh, got 20 assists, 14 goals, and yeah, he's he's really he's in top 10 in scoring in the league. I mean, nobody would have ever predicted that for Nazem Kadri this year. And in, he's done it in games where he's only played like 15 minutes and he's scored like goals and and gotten assists. I think uh, there was one game he played. He had a goal and three assists, and he had only played. Uh, 14 and a half minutes, which is usually not a number you would see on a, like as far as statistics for a player who plays under 20 minutes. Well, I'm sure um, having to uh, getting to start the season with the Marlies and uh, getting the early start with everyone else locked out had something to factor into it. Absolutely. Especially like- with uh, chemistry with some of his teammates. But, I mean, you can tell that he's like, um, Carlisle's letting him play the way that he knows how to play instead yeah. of just focusing on the defensive side. 
but that wasn't what they drafted him for. They drafted him to score goals, and yep. that's what he's doing. Absolutely. And and I think also, too, is that his line mates have really – like, he's helped his line mates. Like, like I said, he has 20 assists. Almost everybody he's played with, he's elevated their game. Like, they had him with MacArthur for a while. He's had good games. Fratton's had good games because of Kadri. And and now they've got Lupo back, who's back from his suspension actually in this game tonight. Um, he has helped Lupo. Like Lupo came back on a freaking terror for the two games he played before his suspension. And I mean, he had nothing coming in. Like he had no goals, no assists before he got injured, Lupo. And now I think he has a, a goal in or two goals and three assists or three goals and two assists in two games. So I mean, Kondry so has the Leafs elevated. have been uh, inconsistent. Like usual, but they they've looked good for the most part this year. So good to yeah. see them back in the playoffs. Yeah, and how about four Canadian teams as of right now sitting in a playoff spot in the Eastern Conference? It's awesome. Yeah, I mean we Love have it. we have definitely seen an improvement in the Canadian teams this year. Even Edmonton, although they're sitting out of the playoffs once again, uh, they've shown signs of fla- uh, of being a better team. And I think again, goaltending. If they had a solid number one goalie, I mean, I think that's been their one of their biggest issues. Obviously, goal scoring is important, but when you're giving up 103 goals, it's kind of, or 88 goals as opposed to only scoring 72. Sorry, the 103 was Calgary. I was looking at the other Canadian team. <laughs> that leaves Calgary. <laughs> yeah, you know, Edmonton and Calgary are like right at the threshold of trying. And Calgary, like as as is, as a team, has been not there at all this year. I think they've had – well, I know Kiprasov was injured at one point. That obviously hurts your team when he usually plays, like, even in an 82-game season, he plays, like, 78 games. So, I mean, it, when you have well, a goaltending issue like that, it's really hard to to do anything with. Well, it looks like Calgary might start their own rebuild anyway, so. Yeah, so on that point, Ginla on the trading block – after Feaster has said many, many times, no, I'm not going to trade him, I'm not going to trade him, he's the face of the franchise, he is now up for sale, apparently. They announced on the weekend that Aguila could be traded at the trade deadline. What do you think of that? Um, I think it was time. I I love Aguila, and uh, it's going to be weird seeing him. He deserves him. a cup. He deserves it's going to be weird seeing him on a different team, oh, but it's like it's like Ray Bork. The guy deserves yeah, the cup. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ray Bork, and he went to your Colorado Avalanche to win that cup. That was a fun year. <laughs> yeah, I bet it was. Um, but, yeah, the uh, some of the teams that they reported that he could go to are Chicago, Detroit, L.A., Boston, and Pittsburgh. That I, Well, it's not where he could go. That's what's on his list because he has no, no trade clause. So he'd waive it for those teams, which which are all playoff uh, contending teams. I'd I'd um, heard recently. Sorry, I'd heard recently that uh, it was just a four team list with Boston, Los Angeles, Pittsburgh, and Chicago. Yeah, Detroit's apparently on that list. But hey, um, I think he doesn't go to Detroit. I don't think he goes to Detroit, Chicago, or L.A. I think he goes to Boston or Pittsburgh. Although Pittsburgh less likely. I can't see if they, they just made. But um, the reason why I say he's probably going to end up in the East is I don't think they want him in the West. They don't want to trade him to a team where it's going to help out, you know, uh, basically somebody that they're going to have to face very often. Like At the same time, they can get more in return from a team like Chicago. Agreed. Uh, agreed. And, and personally, I hope he does stay in the West for the simple fact is you always love those games when a player that's traded is back at his home that was his home for, yeah. like, his entire career, basically. Like, I, I remember, like you said, when Ray Bork was uh, moved to Colorado, uh, one of the first times he came back to Boston was just a huge, huge night. The first time he played in Boston, I mean, he got probably a bigger ovation than the actual Bruins did. <laughs> I I think it'll, um, it'll depend on uh, the conferences and, uh, in uh, next year for um, – that could factor into where he goes because will they want to play him next year? That's true because like I mean they could trade him to a team like Detroit, for example, who is moving to the Eastern Conference. Yeah, and then they wouldn't have to have that problem. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, and and like this year they're not making the playoffs, so it doesn't really affect them this year. So yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Detroit could be a destination for them uh, to trade, and then 
who knows? So I want, speaking of trades, we've had a few in the last couple of days. Uh, Matt D'Agostini going to, um, I believe, uh, St. Louis. No, he's going to New Jersey from St. Louis. And uh, that was just for picks. And then Brendan Morrow from the Dallas Stars went to Pittsburgh for a defenseman, a minor league defenseman and a fifth round pick. Pittsburgh's just getting better and better. And then Pittsburgh signed, uh, also traded for veteran defenseman Douglas Murray, and they gave up two second round picks, one this year and one next for with the San Jose Sharks. So Brendan Morrow, I mean, that's huge going to Pittsburgh. And I can't that's, stand the Penguins because they have Crosby. <laughs> well, that's that's the strongest team in the league right now by far. Yeah, um, I think so. Like that. And they only got better, so. Yeah, they, they, they got they a good nothing leader. Nothing their roster, because like I said, Joe, uh, Joe Morrow, who is the defenseman they traded with Dallas, he is a minor league. Like, he was playing in their minor leagues. He wasn't up with the big club, so it doesn't affect their starting roster. So, yeah. I mean, you, you're only improving yourself by making this trade and not losing any piece of the puzzle. And unfortunately... For my personal opinion, they are probably the, one of the top teams. I mean, they're on a huge streak right now of wins. Um, I think it's at, what, 18, 19 wins now in a row? So, and they're, they're getting hot at a good time, too. So. Absolutely. Like like we just said, there's less than a month in the playoffs, left, or regular season left till the playoffs. And, I mean, this is when you want to be hot. This The last couple of weeks, the last few weeks of the season, when you get hot, we saw it with Los Angeles last year. They they went on a tear. They squeaked into that eighth spot, and then they just ran the table. Like they, Except the problem with this is they're already at the top. Yeah, and we've seen in the past teams rock the 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 whole league, and then they're eliminated in the first round. So, <laughs> do you think we'll uh, do you think we'll see a Crosby Ovechkin first round? You know what? With Washington on the surge they in, and they, if they squeak into that final playoff spot, we could. We could definitely see a Washington, Pittsburgh, Ovechkin versus Crosby round what three or four now. <laughs> they face. Or do you think that um, Washington moves up a bit higher, gets the seventh spot or something? Uh, I don't know because New Jersey is pretty solidly in that spot right now, and they just got Martin Brodeur back. Who, uh, by the way, I just want to note a little tidbit here. He's a New Jersey Devil, and he got win number 666 on the weekend. <laughs> kind of uh, just a little snippet there that I want to about, How about his goal the other day? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, Another I one. with the goal, it wasn't like he shot it in the net, but definitely it was kind of really cool because he has his third career goal, which is more than some players have. What's he ranked in uh, goal goal tending scoring? Do you know? Ah, uh, no, I'd ha- I'd I'd have to look that up. I don't know, but uh, he's got to be right up there because I mean, I'd say he's got to be top three. I would say so. I I totally. I would think Hextel would maybe be one. Hextel's probably uh, up there. I mean, he was the first goalie to actually score a goal himself with uh, empty netter. But there's been other goalies who've been credited with goals just for uh, similar plays to what we've seen when uh, Broder got credited with his. A player has the, or the goalie's pulled for an extra attacker, and player tries to make a pass and goes all the way down the ice and into the empty net. I've seen that play of quite a few times, and the funniest one I've seen was, uh, oh, I can't remember who it was, but they were behind their own net, or behind the opposing team's net, and they went to pass it out in front, like, you know, a quick one timer. The one timer completely fanned, and the pass was so hard. That it went, it just went down the ice, and no player could catch it. It was just funny to see, like the entire. It's, a, it's embarrassing, though. It is embarrassing, but at the same time, like I mean, I don't blame so much the player that passed the puck from out behind the net. I blame the defenseman who couldn't catch up to it. I mean, at that point, that's the defenseman's job, in my opinion. But it is embarrassing for any team to score on their own goal. Uh, I've seen. Numerous own goals were, well, uh, who was it earlier this year? I think it was um, a Breezebois? No, Benoit of the Montreal Canadiens. He shelved it on Terry Bryce, his own goaltender. It was a wicked goal. I never saw that. Oh, man, it was great. Uh, I, I talked about it on a previous podcast. I felt sorry for the guy. But it was it was like, I mean, if he was shooting that on an opposing net, it was a s- sick goal. It was just amazing. But he scored wow. it on Terry Price. He went to clear the puck away and just roofed it. 
That's no good. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, and I think any player that scores on their own goal, always they they feel the worst. They they feel worse than the fans do. They feel worse than anybody. So I mean, that's tough. There you go. I just pulled it up. Brodeur has the most goals. He has the most goals. Yeah, he's got three. He's yeah. got three. Who's second? Hextel. Yeah, it looks like Hextel. That's that's probably right. Yeah, so that's interesting. All right, so let's move away from hockey. We're going to move to a little bit of baseball. Uh, the reason we're moving to baseball, even though the season hasn't started yet, uh, Jays and, and many other teams making moves this week because they got to pare down their roster to the uh, set amount of players before the season opens. And Blue Jays are no exception to that rule. They've listed... Um, Brett Lowry on the disabled list to start the season, and it's going to be retroactive so that he's going to move down to the minors and, and work out there so that uh, he doesn't have to stay on the disabled list as long once the season starts. So he's out. Also, they've made some moves um, in the bullpen. They've moved... Uh, Two pitchers to the minor leagues. Uh, I can't remember who offhand. I had it here. Second ago. You got Lincoln yes. and um, Dave Bush. Yes, Lincoln and Bush have moved to the minor leagues out of the uh, the Blue Jays' pen. And they've also made their catching situation more secure. Aaron Cibia will start opening day. Some people thought Henry Blanco might just because uh, R.A. Dickey was going to be on the mound. And Henry Blanco has secured the backup role, and they're going to send down uh, Josh Tolley to the AAA, which I think is good. Give Tolley the uh, opportunity to play every day. Um, I think that's actually a, a smart move. Um, in uh, Larry's place, they're going to have Mark DeRosa uh, take over third base for a while. And obviously, is Turris and Bonifacio are going to probably spell uh, DeRosa when he needs a day off until Lowry comes back. It looks like uh, Bonifacio is going to get the um, start at second and platoon. Uh, platoon. Asteris will platoon with Bonifacio at second, but to start the season, Asteris is going to platoon with DeRosa at third. All right, so there you go. That's that. Uh, they're still trying to figure out who their uh, roster as far as pitching lineups is going to be. It looks like they have it set. Um, uh, John Gibbons still thinks Romero's got it. Um, he hasn't shown it really much in the in the preseason, but it is preseason baseball. You're, you're working things out. Uh, you're trying new things. So, I mean... He's obviously going to have a better look at it than us because we don't see the practices. We barely get to see the games. So, well, I'm not gonna. I don't take spring training uh, stats too seriously, yeah. but I mean Romero just, even with his changing his mechanics and working on his sinker, I mean he just looked terrible this spring with uh, control. So yeah, absolutely, and and I mean when you're changing, anytime you're changing mechanics, that you're gonna have issues. Yeah, especially in spring training, which is where you want to work out all the all the problems. Like, if, if you're finding something's not working, then maybe you, you go back. If you if you find something is working, maybe you try to adjust it to make it work better. You know, like so spring training, as you said, you can't trust the statistics. And everybody says that the Toronto Blue Jays are going to be a competitive team this year. They're going to be competing in the East with a, a weakened uh, Boston Red Sox team that totally bombed last year. Uh, the New York Yankees are a weaker team. They're also going to start with a lot of guys on, on the disabled list to start the season and also hanging over their head, possible suspension of Alex Rodriguez and Curtis Granderson. And uh, then you have um, the Tampa Bay Rays who are competitive every year, but the Blue Jays are, are one of the top teams in the East, which they haven't been for a long time. And when you look back in the past, I know you were just a young lad, but when they won the World Series, both of them, they had horrible springs. It, it, spring training doesn't mean anything when it comes to the regular season. Well, and if you if you look at the comparisons, too, um, I mean, you can argue this for Ricky, too, but uh, if you're comparing him to Hap based on spring, I mean, the games that Hap plays, there's maybe like two or three regulars that he's pitching against. So that factors in too because you're not facing their top lineups every day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. 
and there there's also like I mean when you're pitching in in spring training you, know, you get like th- especially early on in spring training you get two or three innings in and maybe you're just not warmed up I, I've I've seen in the past I've seen pitchers uh, even Halliday who's probably one of the best Blue Jays pitchers of all time uh, he's had bad first or second innings and then he completes the game only giving up two runs but he gave him up in the first or second inning you know so it, it some pitchers need that first or second inning maybe of not greatness, but just to work it out. And then they're stellar from then on. I mean, look at Romero last year. He started the season 8-0, and and everybody was like, well, he's such a great pitcher. The thing was he was pitching with finesse, I think, a lot more in the early part of the season, and then he was trying to do too much in the latter half. And he is a great pitcher, especially being a left-hander. That, that helps a lot that he's a left-handed pitcher because – you can throw off people, especially with the Jays pitching rotation, if they can go righty lefty, righty lefty, uh, or even have two righties in there and then have Romero in as the fifth starter as a lefty right before you have your knuckleballer. So I mean, as as a lineup goes, they have a great solid rotation that that could be very good. And isn't Hap a lefty as well? Yeah, and the thing about um, if you're gonna compare um, Haps spring to and say hey we need the best five guys right correct because yeah. they're going all in or whatever yeah if you're going with hap based on spring then you would take hap over johnson and dickie oh, yeah. and Burley because exactly. his numbers are better than theirs as well exactly and uh how could you how could you ever do that you wouldn't and i mean that being said too i mean dickie hasn't been there for most of the, the spring training he was there for a couple of weeks and then he had to go to the world baseball classic and then he was there for a few weeks, and then he came back. So, I mean... Um, and so, he got rocked when he came back in exactly. his uh, minor league start. Yeah, so he's he's had a bad spring when you consider the numbers. But I'll, it won't mean I'll, anything. Exactly. When the season starts on April 2nd, it's not going to mean a darn thing. Uh, the and, I think the starting rotation has been announced already, but, I mean, this was earlier, so we don't know if that's staying the same. But... When you got R.A. Dickey leading off your rotation, which we know that's a definite, that he's going to be the opening day starter, and then you follow it up with either Mark Burley or uh, Johnson, Josh Johnson there, um, either one of those pitchers are pretty, like, I, I would say Josh Johnson's probably more of a power pitcher than Burley. Um, so that might be a great second day pitcher because then you, you're, you're facing a knuckleball, which is, what, 70, 80 miles per hour? Yeah, but I, I think they have Morrow going second. I think they do too. I think uh, as it is right now, Morrow is going second. Uh, and he is also a power pitcher. I mean, he's a strikeout pitcher, right? So you're, he's he hits the mid-90s, I think, on his fastball. And I think yeah. Johnson hits about the same. They're pretty similar as far as their speeds. So you, you have either one of those guys, and I think you're right. I think it is Morrow. Uh, you have either one of those guys coming off the knuckleball where they're facing a 70 to 80 mile per hour pitch, and then you're facing a guy who's throwing 90. I mean, it just throws your timing off. And and they can do this throughout the entire season because then you put, I think, Burley's slated third right now? Or is he a fourth? Uh, Burley's third. Okay. They're going to split yeah, up the lefties. Third, who's a lefty, right? So now you've got a lefty coming in after the power righty. He's not a power pitcher. He's a finesse pitcher because he only throws in the high 80s. He might hit a 90 or two here or there, but he, he knows how to locate, though. He knows how to locate. He has that. Uh, doesn't he have a sinker too, Burley? I don't think he has a sinker. Um, I know he's he got has great a command change. with yeah, all yeah, exactly. pitches, though. So I mean, you've got that, and I mean that just that's just he gets a lot of ground balls, but I don't think he has a he throws a sinker. Okay, it must be the changeup that he throws very well then. To to as again, like you said, very good location pitcher. And then, uh, and then you follow that up with Johnson, another power pitcher. And then you round out the rotation with Rookie Romero. And I mean, if he can play the way he's, we know he can play, you got another lefty coming in and, uh, they're facing a lefty right before they face the knuckleballer again. So, I mean, they've got a good lineup as far as, uh, or good rotation as far as balance is concerned. And speaking of the lineup, I mean, everybody in that lineup can hit a home run. It, yeah, it's great. Um, and for the first time in, I don't even know if <laughs> I can remember. 
They have a they have speed to top it off and an actual lead off hitter. Exactly, they have a bona fide lead off hitter. I mean, they, they've had. I don't think they've played a season in the last ten years where they've had a bona fide starter at the at the number one. Well, would eight, you say Shannon Stewart was the last one? Shannon Stewart, maybe Alex Rios. Um, Alex Rios Alex was Rios more of a power hitter, right? But he had the speed, and that's why he was always near the top of the lineup. But uh, Shannon Stewart was probably their last bona fide. Uh, leadoff hitter who had the speed and the um, the average to go with it because he wasn't a not that he had a great average but he was a good on base percentage is I guess that, what that's why they would throw in Reed Johnson too yeah exactly Reed Johnson usually was uh, one or two on the list like uh, I remember if it was a uh, Reed's a righty or a lefty Reed's a righty yeah so when it was a left-handed pitcher he batted number one quite a bit Reed, Reed always got on base. Usually yeah. he got flung, but he was always on base. Yeah, and on base percentage can really be a big factor, especially at the top of the lineup. You want those guys on base, so when you get to that third and fourth hitter in your lineup, the power hitters, you you have runners on when either Batista or Encarnacion is knocking them out of the park. <laughs> Speaking of Encarnacion, uh, hopefully he's ready for opening day. Yeah, I, I read something about Encarnacion. Hang on. Encarnacion update. He's been hitting off the tee. He's expected to be in practice tomorrow, and he's going to be ready. Uh, he says, and the doctors say that he is going to be ready opening day, so hopefully he's going to be good. Uh, he just Basically, his quote is, I need to take some bats before I go into the season. But I feel good. I feel ready to go. I've played every game. Uh, I played every game nine innings at the World Baseball Classic, so I'm ready to go. So, he looked good in the Classic too. Yes, he did. Uh, actually, speaking of a guy who's not going to open with the big club, but Moises Sierra, uh, I mentioned this to you at work. I asked, "Do you think he'll crack the lineup?" And you said, "No." And and I agreed with you because I think he needs the playing time. He, if he comes to the lineup, he's going to be on the bench, right? Well, the Jays have a good bench. So to get him the playing time, he looked really good in the baseball classic. And he's still got lots of time. He's yeah, he's what he's what twenty two right now, yeah, twenty three. Yeah, so 22, 23. Same with Ghost. Um, they had no choice but to send them back so that yeah, exactly they could get some at bats. Oh, Ghost went down. So the, It'll all depend on um, Erasmus would be, I guess, a question. I I don't see him being a problem, but a lot of people see him being a problem. Yeah. Uh, a lot of he's got a lot of critics, and uh, I, I think he, that stems from his days with um, who was he with before the Jays? Milwaukee? No. Uh, Cardinals. Cardinals. Yeah. Um, he. I think that stems from his days there. But the the difference from there to here is that um, they're kind of letting him hit the way he wants to hit, which is something the Cardinals organization wasn't doing. They were making him hit a certain way because they wanted him to be a certain type of player. Uh, I don't know if that's right for an organization to do that. And I read an article uh, back when he was first traded that he had asked his dad for assistance one time. Like uh, Rasmus had asked his dad to come in, and the organization got pissed. Basically, they they were mad at him for asking his dad to come in because they have a hitting coach. You know, well the hitting coach wasn't getting to him. His dad was. So why would you have a problem with that as an organization? Didn't get it. Um, I I don't know. I've been I've heard a lot of different points of views from it. I've heard Rasmus's dad's point of view. I've heard Rasmus's. I've heard the Cardinals. But uh, you, you don't really know for sure what was going on there. So No, and that's exactly it. You're hearing two sides of the story. but I think uh, I think that Matola being their hitting coach, he was a lefty when he played. Correct? Yeah. yeah, I believe so. I, I think he'll help with his approach a lot more than uh, uh, who's their uh, Murphy. Yeah, uh, I, I liked Murphy. He was a good hitting coach, but you're right. Because because he's used to hitting from the left side of the plate, which is uh, something that the Jays, I think, needed actually this year because they have a, quite a few switch hitters, something they haven't had a lot of in the past. And uh, they have a few lefties on their team, left-handed and, batters. And uh, they still have Murphy there to help out if they need to. Exactly. But, but um, there, and now they have a left-handed uh, hitting coach. I mean, now you can get both perspectives. They both hit differently. And... Guaranteed, if anybody needs to talk to Murphy, they're they're, they're not going to say no, right? So, well, Murphy and Gaston, they're oh. they 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 just have one thing: go up to the plate, find your pitch, and then yeah. hit it out of the park. Yeah, and that's why they've been such a power team. They've been a power team in the last couple. But of years. 
the uh, Rasmus is not a power hitter. The thing with Matola, he, he'll hit it out. Yeah, and no, he'll hit it, hit it out, but he's not a power hitter. He's a he's a for average hitter. Like he he hits for. He's average. had a t- he can't hit for average though until he finds consistency. Well, what yeah, the- you're right, you're right, and and I think that consistency can come with the new uh, hitting coach, as you said. Well, Matola will um, he'll find consistency where he's going to um, let Rasmus go in and try to find a pitch that he's looking for instead of just. And he's going to try to make good at bats instead of. Yeah, he's going to get up the work count. Swing at whatever. He see sees. as many pitches as he can. And that's that's been showing so far this spring. He's played, I think, eight eight or nine less spring games this year than last year, and he's got. I think seven more walks than last spring. So, and you he's know what? got a better approach right now. Some batters they need to do that. Like I know Murphy and like he said Gaston, who in my opinion is one of the best gen- managers and hitting coaches the Jays have ever had. Um, those guys are you see your pitch hit it, and it's not a great average. Like when you're trying to hit for average, it's not a great um, philosophy to follow. But that being said, uh, they have been one of the best power hitting teams in the last uh, couple of seasons. And I mean, we saw that with Batista uh, three years ago and two years ago when he was hitting over uh, 50 home runs almost each year. <laughs> he hit, what, 52 the first year, 40, I want to say 48 the second year? I think it was 43. 43? Okay, I knew it was a crooked number. <laughs> and then uh, and then last year, I mean, he was down, but I mean, he was also injured. So He was on. He actually, um, he hit in his 43 home run year. He yeah. set a record, I think, for most home runs at the All Star break. And then he actually passed that record last year. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So and then I, went down to injury. So he was on pace to hit more than 43. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, he uh, and, and he was injured again last year, which which really affected him. I mean, he only hit 23, I think, last year, 23, 24. So I mean, the approach has worked for some batters, but at, with Rasmus's case, I think he's a he's a more patient hitter. Or if he was a more patient hitter, he'd be a better hitter because he would be getting, like you said, he'd be getting the walks like he's gotten in spring training. He'd be look, he'd be able to uh, evaluate the pitches more. And when you can evaluate the pitches more, he could probably even open it up and hit to all fields because he's well, that type of hitter. The argument with between Ghost and Rasmus is Ghost's amazing range and uh, arm in the field. Yeah. Uh, they, they Unreal can, speed. But, no one, he's probably, as, as soon as he comes to the big leagues, one of the, if not the fastest players in the league. Yeah, they they consider him a much better defender than they do Rasmus, but his bat isn't quite there yet. And that's what I would argue is that as much as um, Ghost would, he could get on base and steal you a bunch of bags, and that's how you would get Got runs. Got on base He's, first. There's no way that he would produce the RBIs and no, power exactly. numbers that Rasmus no. can. Uh, and and you're Rasmus exactly right. Ghost base. doesn't have that power in him. He doesn't have the RBI in him. He's he's going to be a top of the lineup guy when he does break the club, I think. And uh, because you know, top of the lineup guys aren't really RBI producers; they're RBI generators. Yeah. So um, I think that's where he's going to be. Whereas Rasmus is more of a middle to bottom of the lineup guy. Like yeah, I think he's batting seventh. Somewhere around there. Yeah. He, they might start him off. Uh... I don't know if they will, but they might start him off fifth in front of Larry when Larry comes back. Oh, that's, that's possible. And then have Lind bat lower if Lind, because Lind's another guy that they're going to have to try to find consistency with. Yeah, I, I think if they don't find consistency with Lind this year, he won't be a Blue Jay for very long because it's not like they don't have anybody that can take over at first. Uh, and Canarseon, as we saw last year, could very well do that. Um and Lind was even optioned to the minors, like outright optioned to the minors last year. So he's he's played his way back onto the team, which is good for him as far as uh, a personal thing is concerned. But I think if he doesn't perform for the Jays this year, he could be gone. And that would be the same with Rasmus, obviously. With Absolutely. Ghost right there and Sierra right there. Absolutely. But I, I didn't think there was as big of a rush to get Ghost to no. the majors like no. everyone else. Much like Sierra, 
you want him to play. Exactly. Um, for for the bullpen, what do you what do you think? Uh, the last spots I think are between Jeffries, Cecil, and Hap, maybe. Probably. Uh, again, that all comes to how Gibbons. Like Gibbons doesn't have to make a decision on his fifth day starter uh, right away because I mean you have a uh, few games to play before you get to that fifth game starter. So whether he wants it to be Hap or Romero, depending on how he wants to go, he's got. A, he doesn't have to make that decision right now. I think Hap is almost a shoe in to make the uh, to bullpen if he doesn't make the opening uh, or if he doesn't make the rotation. Um, he's obviously performed very well in his his goings, even though he has said he doesn't want to be a bullpen guy. He wants to be a starter. I think if he's a team guy, which I hope he is. He will go to the bullpen to start the season. Yeah, I, I think Happ and Cecil have the inside edge just because Cecil has the experience a little bit, just a little bit more with the Jays. But that being said, I mean, Jeffries has looked pretty decent in the spring too. Um, I'm not a big fan of Jeffries. He throws, he, he can hit a hundred. Yeah. But he, he can't control it. It's, uh, it, it, he sort of reminds me like Zumaya. I don't know if you remember him from the Tigers. Zuma. Everyone yeah, was just, yeah, Joel Zumaya. Yeah, everyone was just so impressed with the heat that he threw. Yeah, but that's, he couldn't do anything with it. That's absolutely true. If you can't locate a hundred mile an hour fastball, it doesn't matter that you can throw it hundred miles if you can't locate the strike zone. And that's where I think he, him and Cecil are both out of options. So I think that they would choose to stick with Cecil and. Well, more than Jeff. I think Cecil, the other in the mix is Aaron Loop. Loop's Loop's gonna get a spot though. Uh, they might all get a spot though because I think with Lowry out, they uh, they might have an extra reliever to start the season. That's that's been reported. Uh, I heard that on Sportsnet and on TSN that uh, they might actually go with an extra reliever to start the year. But if you have Jansen, Santos. Rogers, Luke, Hap, Oliver, Oliver, Hap, yeah, and that leaves, yeah, two more spots. So yeah, spots. So Cecil and uh, Jeffries they, both make the opening day team. That's not to say they'll both stay with the team, but they'll make it. Uh, Jeffries makes me nervous. So does Cecil because I've seen Cecil obviously. Cecil, yeah, Cecil's been inconsistent, right? I mean, he's had but, great flashes of brilliance. But other other times he's looked like a pitcher that you can just be lit up. But Cecil's downright filthy against left-handers. I mean, over the past three seasons, if you look at the stats versus lefties, isn't it below two? He's been almost as consistent as Darren Oliver. Has isn't the opposing batters average like for lefties below two hundred against him? Yeah, it's almost it's almost consistent with Darren Oliver's numbers. Yeah, and that's and that's that's awesome when you have a left-handed specialist. Uh, Especially when you're facing a team like the Yankees, who have a lot of left-handed batters, because and they have the, a lot of left-handed batters because of playing in Yankee Stadium half the year with that short left or uh, right field fence. Left-handed pull hitters have a great chance of hitting home runs. And it also might be beneficial to them to keep Cecil because with being out of options, if they lose him to waivers, waivers, yeah, goodbye to have. He would be a good guy to have for um, future years yep. if Oliver decides to retire. Which he probably will do after the season. I mean, there was exactly. he wasn't going to come back this year, so. And then you don't have a lefty specialist anymore, mm-hmm. and he's mm-hmm. looking for your guy if you decide to keep him. Which is which is why I agree with you. I think he stays with the club. He, there's going to be no options used unless he's like way underperforming, and then and then, even then, I think uh, they'll they'll search trade options before they. Uh, Considered just dropping him down to the minors, and then there's yes, sorry, yeah, I saw that. Leafs just scored a beauty. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> and then watch did you see Audrey get rocked before that? Yeah, I did. I, oh I, I'm God. kind of watching it, but not. Uh, like I got it on mute, so uh, such a dirty hit, though. Uh, yeah. There's been a lot of that this year. That's the Bruins, though. All uh, right. So, Dustin, anything else you want to say? Dustin McGowan has a big. Yeah. Outside shot at making the club. Yeah, uh, I, you know what? I feel so bad for the man. I mean, he 
when he was healthy, he was probably a number three starter, even maybe a number two starter. He's got some of the nastiest stuff I've ever seen. If He's he could, such a good pitcher. If he could control it better. Yeah, I know. Got and he's healthy, feet. and that's the thing. His breaking the balls are just, in, like, I've never seen. I, he would, I've he would loved, throw it in the dirt every time, and everyone would still swing at it. I love Dustin McGowan's pitching. I mean, he's done so well, and yet he's had health issues that have kept him out of the lineup way more than in in the last five years, and that sucks because, I mean, you're you're wasting your good years, you know? Like, I mean... Because he's, he's 30 now. He's so. 30 now, exactly. I mean, that that's not to say, like, I mean, athletes these days, and this goes for any sport, are playing a lot later than they used to. I mean, 35, most most people were retired. Now you see players playing into their 40s. And, and th- this is across any sport. They're playing into their 40s everywhere. And I think that has to do with the better conditioning, uh, as, especially in... Uh, certain sports like football and hockey, they, they, they're really cracking down on player safety. Even though players still get injured, there's always going to be injuries in sports. It's always going to happen and there's always going to be saw the, with the Jays like, last year. Yeah, you're always going to see the dirty players and you're always going to see the freak injuries. But uh, generally injuries are, are coming down as at least the severity of injuries are coming down. And that I think extends players' careers. I I would say for McGowan, he should have tried uh, developing a knuckleball, but that's just not kind of the kind of guy that he is. He's, oh, yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? You, you like, it, yeah. it, it maybe would have helped his arm yeah. and with the kind of injuries that he has. But. Yeah, you're right, because it, it is a little bit easier on the arm to throw the knuckleball. And But then again, uh, Dickie still... But what you like about McGowan is how dirty his exactly. pitches are. Exactly. So, and I mean, when you've developed a style your whole career, and even though like injuries obviously affect your career, uh, when you've developed that style and you're and you're pretty decent at that style, it's hard to just change it up. Like I mean, Dickey brought in the knuckleball how many years ago now? Like five, I think he said, and he only perfected it in the last two or three. But <laughs> the last two or three, or, they've been really good. So yeah. But the the thing with Dickey and McGowan is Dickey was never as close talent wise as McGowan. Oh, that's the thing. Like he 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 was more of a um, he was he was more of a control pitcher. He's a guy that had the stuff that you would need to control to have success. Yeah. But he didn't have the control. Yeah. He he needed to have the control to be a a much better pitcher than he was. Exactly. So. Other baseball news, Kyle Loesch looks like he's agreed to terms with the Brewers. Kyle Loesch to the Brewers. Looks good for my fantasy team because I drafted him and I, and I was told, yeah, he's not signed with anybody. I'm like, ah, crap. <laughs> yeah, well, he signed with a good team. So. Yeah, uh, Brewers. Brewers have a good starting rotation. Assuming Braun doesn't get suspended. Uh, I would think that he might get – they're going to try to suspend him. I don't. I don't know when during the year, but I can see him missing some games. Yeah, um, it's I've heard so many different um, different reactions from people of how, whether they think these players because I think there's four or five of them that were listed that could face 50 game suspensions this year, and I know two of them are Yankees uh, in Granderson in, and uh, Rodriguez, but uh, it it definitely looks like. Um, it's going to come down to a matter of whether Bud Seeley can actually find the evidence he wants before he makes any decisions. And if he does, these guys are getting suspended. But if he doesn't, they may never get suspended. And so it's kind of a toss up whether they do or they don't. Uh, I heard that it will only be 50 games. I know you had mentioned uh, in the past that you thought it could go as high as a hundred, but it would look like it's unless there's like other things found, but based on the information right now, it's going to be 50 games each. Well, um, that, I think it should be more personally, just because well, if he gets caught, it will be live. Well, so, I think it depends on, like, don't they have the the kind of like a three strike and you're out type policy? Like, yeah. A first suspension. I think it depends on what, of games what they use too. 
Yeah, and, and that's exactly it. And I think that's why the talk is that it'll be a 50-game suspension. So you look at that, that's approximately a third of the season, just under a third of the season. They play 162. So just under a third of the season if they do get suspended, and that, that'll that really hurt the Yankees more than anybody else. Yeah, for sure. Not but that I'm complaining. The, I, hate I mean, <laughs> the Yankees, they, uh, they're working on acquiring Vernon Wells, so. Yeah, you mentioned that. Some, that some is former Jays scraps. Uh, Vernon is definitely not, um, he's in a full outfield in, uh, in Los Angeles right now. I mean, he's just, there's just so many outfielders that are actually better than him at the moment. I mean, he's a twilight of his career. He's winding up. So. You know what, though? I have nothing against Vernon. Oh, absolutely not. I, I don't either. He was a class act in Toronto. He's a crowded he was, outfield. That's the, it was J.P. The, Ricciardi who gave him the contract. Yep. Obviously, yep. you're going to accept that kind of money if yep. you're offered it. Uh, and I think any player would be stupid not to. Like, it, exactly. It's not the but player's choice. He, he was, a lot of times. He never said anything bad about the organization or the city, so. I agreed. I, I played well. Respect for Vernon. I still love Carlos Delgado for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would love to see those guys back. You can't. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> did you see uh, Johnny Mack got traded to the Pirates? Yeah, I did. Oh, uh, I would have loved to have him for a World Series. Yeah, exactly. I, I would love to get him into the playoffs as a J. But yeah, um, Kyle Lowe's shining with Milwaukee really bolsters uh, their pitching um, rotation. Because, I mean, in Milwaukee, they have. Uh, Estrada, uh, they have Gallardo. I can't think of their other guys right now, but I mean, now you're throwing in Kyle Loesch. Um, I would assume he'd slot into the number two spot behind Gallardo. Probably, probably he'll probably put Estrada down to third. But I mean, they they definitely have a solid rotation, especially their top three guys right now. So. Um. Scott Casimir is making a comeback. I guess he won the Indians starting five job. Oh, good for him. Yeah, haven't haven't heard him in a while. Nope, nope. He sort of just busted after he left Tampa. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, you heard him all over when he was in Tampa, and then he leaves Tampa Bay, and I didn't hear of him at all last year. I never heard Scott Casimir's name barely. I haven't heard him in a couple of years now. Yeah, so, but yeah. Uh, We'll see how he does. He won't. We won't see him in the Jays opening series because he'll be the number five. But. Yeah, he'll be lower down the uh, the roster, but still. Uh, um, what else do we got? Chen Ming Wong's back with the Yankees. Yeah, Chen the Ming. The former 19 game winner. Yeah. The uh, one with whether the he diarrhea does. guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he's returning home, so to speak. That's where he started his career. What do you think of the Yankees with, okay, we got Jeter out, we got Teixeira out, Granderson out, yep. A-Rod yep. out. A-Rod out, yeah. Okay. Uh, like I was saying earlier, they're yeah. injury riddled, they're, that's going to hurt them, they're going to start the season um, probably near the bottom of the of the barrel when it comes to the AL East, and uh, if teams like um, Tampa and the Jays can jump on top of them early, we always know that the Yankees are never to be counted out, but when you have that many guys injured, and some of them for probably well into the season, like I think um, some of them are missing one to two months of the actual season. I think everyone except Jeter, out of the players that I just named, is out until May. Yeah. The middle of May, I'm pretty sure. And yeah, the which Jays is play them 12 times, I think. Exactly. And if you can, okay, let's say if, if it is 12 times, if the Jays win eight to 10 of those games, I mean, that just bumps them so far back. And, and, and then you, they got to play the Red Sox, which I think are a struggling team right now. And they, and, and the Rays, uh, I mean, they've always been competitive. So <laughs> I, I think Red they, Sox got some good pieces, but I, I, I don't see their, they're, I don't know how their chemistry will be. That's exactly Darryl. right. That's exactly it. So, plus you're bringing all these other players together that have never played with each other. It's the same thing with the Jays, but the only the only bad thing I see about Wells going to the Yanks is he's going to have to come and play the the Jays a lot more. 
<laughs> I mean, he's probably not going to be like, he's going to be more of a, I don't know if he's going to be in there. He's definitely going to be in their outfield to start. I think because with Granderson out, they're going to need an outfielder, right? So. Yeah. And usually, usually gets a good ovation when he comes. Oh back. yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it, it's just going to suck to see him play against the Jays so much more so than when he was with Los Angeles. Well, we can hope that his average will be what it was with uh, the Angels. <laughs> so. Well, we we do know that Vernon Wells is notorious for starting the season slow. As as Jays fans, we know that his his average and his home runs come later in the year, not, which is good because of the amount of times he faced the Yankees. It's a exactly to start the year, if his average is where we expect it to be, it might not be so bad. <laughs> but you're right. I think when he does play Toronto the first time as a Yankee, even though he is a Yankee, uh, he will get an ovation because, let's face it, he was a class act in Toronto, and you know, and Toronto fans don't forget that. Yeah, they they're good to their uh former players. Their players that were loyal. Yeah, absolutely. as they should be. Well, uh, absolutely. Look at any time Johnny Mac comes into Toronto. I mean, that guy is beloved by the fans of Toronto. He's like an adopted son almost. Oh, I love Johnny Mac. I, Everybody loves. Whenever Johnny. he would come into a game, when I would go see a game, he got the biggest ovation out of any other player that was coming up. All right. Uh, do you want to talk about Aaron Sebius getting the opening day start, or do you want to save that for another day? Uh, we could talk about it quickly here before we wrap up. Um, Aaron Sebius getting the opening day start. Well, he did work with Dickey in the WBC. Um, he has been working with Dickey as much as possible in spring training. Uh, a lot of people thought that Blanco would get it after the last start because Blanco actually started Dickey's last start in spring training. But I think he struggled with it. He did, but I think um, I like. Well, I wouldn't the, say struggled, but I like the idea because I really like the fact that um, they're giving Aaron Sebia the chance to catch Dicky opening day because you do want Aaron Sebia in your lineup more often than not. Now, I mean, this could be a further indication of how Gibbons wants to see, like we might see Aaron Sebia get the first few starts uh, with Dickey, depending on how, you know, the schedule plays out. Uh, he can always go to Blanco if Aaron Sebia struggles. This could turn right. out good for Blanco too. Because... <laughs> cool him in. Oh, <laughs> I had no idea what you were yelling at. I see. Okay. Cool him just scored on a breakaway, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Another another good thing for this could work out for Blanco is that he not being strictly Dickie's guy, he can get more playing time that way because they could give him more starts with Johnson or Burley or Morrow. I would I would put Blanco I would give Blanco a go with Romero. Yeah. It it, it could help to have a veteran catcher. Better catcher better him, pick, yeah. Knowing, knowing more of what hitters, uh, where hitters need to have the ball. I mean, Jose Molina helped Ricky a lot when he was with the club, so maybe a veteran catcher could uh, benefit him. Mm hmm. Absolutely, I agree. So, I mean, that, that could be a help for Romero, which would just be awesome. Like, I mean, if, he, if he's the fifth day starter and then you have Blanco starting every fifth day with Romero. I, and and it helps. I mean that that just makes the the Blue Jays rotation that much more possibly threatening. You know, like I mean. But to be honest, uh, an average Romero, any of the thirty teams would take him as their fifth starter. So. <laughs> yeah. Let's I be def- real. So. I definitely agree. Like I mean, there are teams out there that I look at. Like I just did my fantasy some of my fantasy drafts and I'm looking at pitchers and you know, after the top tier guys, most teams fourth and fifth starters, you don't want on your team because they're going to lose a lot more than they win. And while Romero did have a bad second half of the year last year, cause I, I think his first half was all right, but uh, his, his second half was definitely a lot worse. And uh, 
if you can get that out of your fifth day starter, or at least be in games, especially with the way the Jays are probably going to be a much better offensive team this year, and which is saying a lot because, as we said earlier, they're a powerhouse hitting team. They've hit a lot of home runs in the last couple of years. I mean, if he can keep his team in the game for most of his starts, I mean, that's that's fantastic. And whether it's Blanco that helps, or Blanco, however you say that last name, uh, that helps him, or whether he just figures it out, Either way, I'd much rather have him as my fifth day starter than most of the fifth, fourth and fifth starters in, on most other teams. Exactly. It's uh, it's not going to be as bad as people are making. The problem is that the Jays have so much hype that people are still looking to try try to find ways to be negative because they don't want to have too much hope going into it. Uh, oh, absolutely. And you know what? Any team. That gets hype, and I think we've seen this in football a couple of years, or yeah, two years ago with the Philadelphia Eagles. And I think well, we've that seen was, it with the Red Sox a couple of years ago too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, teams come in with all this hype, and that means you also have all this pressure. You have so much pressure on you to perform that you've now kind of put yourself off your game because you've got now the pressure on yourself from the fans but you're putting the pressure on yourself personally, and I think that's where it's more, because there's always pressure from fans, especially in Toronto. Um, Toronto's one of the biggest media markets next to New York as far as fan pressure and media pressure. But when you start putting that pressure on yourself, that's when you start underperforming. The thing I like about this team, though, compared to other dream teams or whatever you want to call it, is that they already had the core set that they wanted. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, they they have their young guys. I mean, Lowry is there. He's been uh he's been great for them. Uh they they signed Batista, who's been amazing for them in the last few years. Um they have guys coming up in the system now. This all being said, uh one thing I do want to mention, Travis Darno. I think that kid is going to be a fantastic player and while I am very happy that Dickey's here now, they need to make the playoffs with Dickey. Because otherwise that trade, in my opinion, is going to hurt them in the end. Especially, oh no. What a bad goal. Right, <laughs> again. Especially if uh, Johnson, if they lose and Johnson chooses free agency and free leaves, agency. Yeah. then you lose Dickey and Johnson, your yeah. two biggest attractions from those trades. Yeah. And and you lost some good players. Like I mean, I actually preferred the uh, the Florida trade. What we lost in that, uh, what what they gave up, uh, I can accept because of who we got. It, yeah. The Dickey trade. Well, Dickey, yes, won the Cy Young in in the National League last year, um, and is has been a much better pitcher in the last three years than he was when he started. The the fact that they gave up uh, Darno and uh, who was the other young guy? Um, Cindergard. Cindergard. Both those guys, I think, are going to be very good, but Darno even more so. Uh, I think Darno is a future All Star, personally. I think they both. Cindergard. He, I mean, they're both just prospects. Yeah, exactly. You never he's, know. He's, you never he's know with been... a prospect. It's it's what you've seen so far, and so far I could classify them, like you said. Um, well, uh, I said Cinder- uh, or Darno is probably a future All Star, but Syndergaard could easily be a future All Star. Well, Syndergaard, he's drawn comparison to Doc and yeah. and Doc's an All Star. Darno to Posey, so yeah. I mean, if they do pan out, they could be both very good All Stars. <laughs> Absolutely, and and that's where it's like, oh, you're but you're giving up that because you're trying to win now. And, and at the same I, time, I do understand that. I do understand that there's uh, a need to be, especially in Toronto, a need to be in the playoffs when you haven't been in the playoffs in almost 20 years. And last year, being a wild card team up until all those injuries, they and they knew that with the decline of the Yankees and the Red Sox, they knew that this was their time that they could make a push. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and I, and I think that's exactly it. I think even I personally think with the team on paper, everyone healthy, 
they win the East. That being said, even if they don't come out and storm the AL East, they could easily get one of those two wild cards. And that is a start. And I mean, they can, in my opinion, they have a competitive team enough that they should be mentioned in the top probably three to four teams that can make the World Series this year. And yes, as we said, that puts pressure on a team. And hopefully they don't let that pressure get to them personally because I think they definitely have a very talented, very, uh, as we've seen in spring training, we've even seen Mark DeRosa and uh, um, Bonifacio have great games. And I mean, if that can translate, in, and DeRosa's had a great spring like, overall. So I, I would like to see in close games this year, we all know Gibbons is great at controlling a bullpen. Yeah. And he's good at platooning. Yeah. I would love to see in a really close game him not be afraid to, if someone gets on base, throw in Davis or uh, Bonifacio to try to get to third or in scoring position. Uh, oh, I agree. I, uh, that was something we've seen last year a lot. Somebody would get on base, and then Rajay Davis would come in, steal second, steal third. You know, <laughs> or Rajay would be starting. I'm talking about say, um, but Rasmus or someone gets on first. Yeah. Then don't be afraid to take him out and, and put, put Bonifacio. In Bonifacio. Yeah, no, I agree. And and as you told me, uh, Bonifacio is a true utility player. He can play in the outfield or in the infield in almost any position. He's, so, I mean, to, to sacrifice um, Rasmus for Bonifacio, you're not losing a lot. Well, and, his and, primary position was center field. Yeah, you're right. So, I mean, I, I think hopefully, like, I mean, when Gibbons was here the first time, near the end especially, I think both you and I were on his case a lot. We wanted him out. Um, I wanted more JP Ricciardi, but Gibbons had to go too. Yeah, exactly, and I'm so glad JP is gone. JP had to be. Uh, oh, JP was the worst man. Uh, I used to when the Jays would lose games, I would <laughs> yell at the TV, but yeah. yell to JP <laughs> when they would show him on the screen. Oh God, yeah, nobody liked JP, and he and he left the the Jays in a much worse condition even than he got them, and that's not saying much because when he got them, they were pretty bad shape too. But uh, no, I I've liked how Alex Anthopoulos has. Um, run the team since he's taken over. Uh, I haven't agreed with everything that he's done, but you, you never will. But he's tried to build the team up, and I think he's definitely succeeded in that. He's made them a quite competitive team compared to uh, the way they've maybe played in the past. And um, it, it's nice to see them being talked about by not just the Canadian media anymore. They're actually being mentioned in the American media. They're ranking high in the, in the rankings on most American sites. And that's where you want to see it because it's the American game, right? So, I mean, it's not like it's hockey where they're talking about the Canadian teams more because the Canadian teams are, it's our, it's a sort of our game, but in baseball, it's the American pastime. So when American websites and American media are all talking about, the Blue Jays, as a Blue Jays fan, that makes you go, yes, we're finally making it in a different market. Speaking of Anthopolis, you got really mad last year over a trade. <laughs> yes, I did. And it looks like the piece they got in that trade is might be stretched into a starter in AAA. So do you, how do you think, do you think they won it or is it tied? Cause Snyder's looking for a spot on the yeah, He still uh, hasn't earned it. Okay, I, I've always liked Snyder, and I, I just, I, I think the change last year helped him because when he did leave, uh, he actually performed better than when he was with the Jays. But like you said, he is fighting for a spot now this year, and he may not even make the team, which is kind of how he was in Toronto. He was always fighting for a spot. Uh, and now, uh, I forget who we got. We got that picture, I know, but, um, he he is probably going to make a starting pitcher in AAA. So at this point, I would consider this a tie, but I'm going to give the slight edge to the Jays. I think maybe Alex Anthopoulos saw something that obviously... It worked well for them last year. Didn't. Yeah. 
Yeah, he did. I'm going to blame Snyder's progress on J.P. Ricciardi just because I can blame everything on J.P. Ricciardi. <laughs> you know oh, what? I'll blame, that... if it's not, I'll blame it on J.P. Ricciardi or Brian Burke, but I'll blame it on one of those two, <laughs> even if it has nothing to do with them. Yeah, uh, although with blaming Brian Burke, Nazem Kadri was a Burke draft pick. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. Everything bad that goes. I could. I could <laughs> be talking bad. about. I could be talking about the Raptors and say it's Brian it's Burke. Brian Burke's fault. In this situation. Stupid Raptors. <laughs> yeah, like he was at their game once and they lost by thirty. He, so it was it was just the way he was looking at it was them. Brian Burke's fault because he was there. Yeah. Yeah. I I get it. I get it. <laughs> it's just easy to blame him or JP. So I'll, that's what I'll keep doing. Uh, I, I will I, say that with uh, Travis Snyder, I think. Uh, sending him up, uh, calling him up, sending him down, calling him up, sending him down so many times as the Jays did was definitely detrimental to him. And Especially as a 19 year old. I mean, he had all the talent. I wouldn't say he was a Bryce Harper, but that's how they treated him when they called him up. Exactly. Um, sometimes players need that development. You want, they, they show flashes of brilliance and you call them up at a young age. And then you send them down, and then for the rest of the next three to four years that they're signed, you're calling them up and sending them down so many times that you're actually hurting them more than helping them. And, some and when they called them up was when it was Gaston and Walker or uh, Murphy, and Murphy's not the best. I wouldn't say he's the best hitting coach to teach and develop someone proper, you're probably, um, yeah. proper plate discipline. Yeah, yeah, uh, and some and some players respond uh, differently to different coaches. Uh, some certain coaching styles just don't work with other play, with uh, certain players depending on their personal style. So actually, you know what? It might have been Gene Tennis. Gene Tennis, really? Yeah. Huh. Well, I think that um, Snyder was definitely um, treated badly as far as being called up and down so often, and I think that hurt him in Toronto more than anything. But as you said, he's he's trying to compete for a spot now, so it's not like he's lighting it up where he is. It's not. He could still be a, a decent player, but uh, as far as like maybe an all star or anything like that, I I doubt it. Um, I think he's probably going to be a. Third starter on most teams, possibly even a bench player on some teams, and minor leaguer for other teams. I'll, I'll always have some love for the lunchbox hero. <laughs> oh, don't anyway. get I think I, I, I've liked Snyder since he was first called up to the Jays. And again, probably called up too early, but he will always be somebody that I think could have been a great player if handled differently. Yeah, for sure. Anyways, Razor, I gotta head out, but um, it was it was great being on here. I'd like to be back some other times. Definitely, definitely. And um, thanks very much, Zach. And uh, we're gonna end the sports segment now. So, see you later, Zach. So, I hope you enjoyed the previously recorded sports talk with Zach. And uh, if you're still listening, I'm happy. If not, I will. Uh, Definitely not be upset that you stopped it early. I know this is running really long, but that is it for this week. So I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you listened to the whole show. And if not, you maybe skipped ahead to the end to hear this. But remember, anotherpodcast.com. That's E-H-N-O-T-H-E-R podcast.com. And uh, for those of you who are on YouTube, I've started putting my older podcasts on YouTube. And uh, I will link that channel once everything is set up and ready to go, once the older podcasts are all on there. And I hope you enjoy everything that you hear. And um, I hope you keep listening. So don't forget, tune in tomorrow for Teen Talk Thursdays. And tune in next week and listen to the whole week of shows that we have. We have four shows confirmed all the time now. And uh, that's... Eight, that's re- uh, I'm getting them mixed up. It's Another Monday, Real Tuesday, Warlock Wednesdays, that's the one you're listening to right now, and Teen Talk Thursdays with Chelsea. So if you're going to listen to the network, listen to all the shows, maybe some of them don't interest you, maybe they do, maybe you know somebody who would like to listen. So give it a listen, check us out on anotherpodcast.com, and check us out on iTunes. I'll see you next week, and I hope you enjoy the show. 
Thanks for listening to Another Podcast from AnotherPodcast.com. Don't forget to go on iTunes and or download right from AnotherPodcast.com. That's E-H-N-O-T-H-E-R Podcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at Another Podcast. Be sure to check back for tomorrow's show only on Another Podcast, your Canadian podcast network. AnotherPodcast.com. Not a sponsor.